بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last week we're talking about an important topic and we're extracting from it lessons which really matter to us especially especially to the youth it is about the purpose of our life and how it all began the whole reason why we're here Iblis the king of the jinns of the shayateen of the devils he's a real existence the angels who are made from the light and they don't disobey Allah in any command he gives them they've been created to obey him subhanahu and then the human beings the human beings who have been created for the same purpose that the jinns were created for and that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala earn our place in Jannah save yourself from hellfire this is what matters to us this is what matters to you you don't find a person sitting back and saying I'm not going to work I'm not going to do anything of that because it requires hard work and I don't see the point of it he says no I'm gonna get up and I'm going to do the work and do what it takes because if I don't do it I'm not gonna reap in the benefits after I'm not gonna get the money I'm not gonna be able to get married I'm not gonna be able to open the house I'm not gonna be able to buy what I want so we all look at what benefits us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he speaks to, to us the story of the debate between him and and Iblis and the beginning and then he tells us that he is our enemy and his tricks he talks to us about what benefits us, what benefits you, not what benefits Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iblis refused to prostrate to, Allah, to Adam alayhi salam. He was in the ranks of the angels. He was a righteous person before. He lost that righteousness because of his choice. Allah tested him for himself, for, the, for Iblis himself, not so that Allah can know and Iblis refused that was his problem you will never become a true believer brothers and sisters until the main problem in your heart if you know what it is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is resolved a mu'min resolves their sin a mu'min doesn't keep their sin and who can tell me where the sin starts everyone? Who can tell me where the sin starts in the person? Where does an action come from in yourself? Why do you act upon something? Where does it start from? The mouth? Well, good guess, but the mouth is an action. So you don't say something until what happens? Where is the root of the sin? Your intention? Yes, it is inside. It's something inside your heart, inside your mind. What you have fed over these years, your heart and your mind, that will delegate the type of actions you're going to take, carry out in your life. So we need to monitor what's inside our hearts. What's the problem in there? Is it jealousy? Is it proudiness? Haughtiness? Is it the love of wealth? What is it? For Iblis it was jealousy which caused him to have proudiness and refuse the command of Allah. So Allah said to him, and we've already mentioned the conversation and the debate and we've gone into detail with it. We spoke that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا فَإِنَّكَ رَجِيمٌ He said to Iblis, Get out of this rank which I gave you. The rank was that he had a high position with the angels. He wasn't an angel, but he was, he was a jinn. فَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا فَإِنَّكَ رَجِيمٌ You are now an outcast. You are out, I mean thrown out. We don't want people with a disease like yours in here. The disease of Iblis was a cancerous disease. It was one that cannot be cured. Allahu Akbar. Make the comparison. One that cannot be cured, what is it? Jealousy which resulted in proudiness? How bad is jealousy? Allahu Akbar. It can result in an uncurable disease. So a Muslim must avoid that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now turns to Adam alayhi salam and he says to him to live in a place which he called Jannah. 
Now last week we didn't have the opportunity to speak about this Jannah but someone asked me is it the same Jannah that we will be going to? Allah knows best but our scholars did mention that the Jannah which Adam السلام, was in was probably a different to the Jannah which Allah has in store for us. Number one there are sins in there where he was. There was, an there was a possibility of him being taken out of Jannah whereas once you enter it you will never come out. There are a few differences. There is the whispering of the shaitan in there, whereas in Jannah there's no more of that. So it is a Jannah, it is a type of paradise, it is beyond this world, it is a supernatural place. But is it like the Jannah that we are now promised? Allah knows best, but I think it is not, based on the scholars' research about that. But it was a paradise in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Adam, وَإِنَّ لَكَ فِيهَا أَلَّا تَجُوعَ وَلَا تَعْرَى In this paradise where I'm going to put you in, you will have in it many things. Among them are two very special gifts. And they are, you will never become desperate for food and you will never need to be desperate for clothing. In other words, you will have food at your pleasure and clothing at your pleasure. Don't ask how much or how beautiful they are or how tasty they are. They're at your disposal. There is nothing of, you know, I'm afraid that one day I will run out of food, so I'm working for my food, I'm working for my clothing, for my shelter. It wasn't going to go through that in Jannah. So these are some of the gifts which Allah gave Adam السلام, when he entered Jannah. There are some narrations in Tafsir ibn Kathir, if you read in some of the other scholarly books, it says that Adam السلام, was in paradise alone at first. And it says that استوحش, meaning he felt lonely. And he didn't know what this loneliness was from. So one day, Adam السلام, found, it says that he was napping. Allahu alam what exactly he was doing, but he found before him his wife Hawa, a woman. And his loneliness immediately faded, it went away. And he asked her, Man anti, who are you? She said, Allah created me so that you can find your peace and tranquility with me. Taskun. You know, when somebody's paranoid or going through an anxiety, or going through any some sort of loneliness. Well, she said, Allah created me so that whatever you're feeling will go away. You're going to find your peace and tranquility with me. So the miracle and the blessing of husband and wife is amazing. It's a miracle. Allah calls it a miracle in the Quran, in several ayat in the Quran. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا And among his miracles is that he created from yourselves your spouses. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And he made between you compassion, kindness and mercy. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ In this there, there are many miracles and signs for people who ponder, people of understanding. So marriage is a sakina, it's a time of peace and tranquility. Not one of fighting, getting into a wrestling match and ready to have a challenge. Will the man win or will the woman win? No. So he went in there, and when this wife was there for him, Hawa, our mother Eve, Hawa, something happened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now with his ultimate plan, his uh, beyond our knowledge, in which his qadr, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pre-measurement of all things comes into place exactly where they belong. We can't explain it because we don't know. Our knowledge is limited. We can't even begin to comprehend it, let alone understand our own human body. His qadr came into place, his pre-measurement of all things, his will, subhana. He said to Adam alayhi salam and Hawa, about Jannah, he said, وَكُلَا مِنْهَا حَيْثُ شِئْتُمَا Eat from this paradise anything you desire. Anything at all you desire, take it from Jannah. 
But there was one condition as we all know. He said, But see this tree over there? You are not allowed to come near it. Allah did not say don't eat from it. He didn't say don't touch it. He didn't say don't sit un under it. He said, Don't even come near it. You will both become among the ones who have oppressed. Oppressed. You know, when you wrong someone, you do injustice. You will do injustice to yourselves. This is very interesting. It's not just a matter of, it's not just a story about, oh, he said to them, don't eat from a tree, and, and then they didn't, and then they ate from it. No, 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 it's actually not. In the Quran it says, Don't even come near it. In the Christian version, the biblical version, Obviously, the Bible has been changed. But now, their information is that God told them it was an apple tree and that you shouldn't eat from the apple tree. And that there was a, a serpent who is Iblis, the devil, like a snake who was in Jannah. And he was trying to delude them. And then his wife, Hawa, is the first one. She is the one that deluded Adam. And it was her fault, and because of her, women are cursed, so therefore they go through menstruation and pregnancy, so they can suffer in this world as a punishment. This obviously, all of it, is rejected by the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Except for some parts that are still correct. The Islamic view, the Qur'an and the Sunnah says, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Adam and Hawa, both of them together, at the same time, with the same rules and the same commands and prohibitions. He said to them, don't even come near this tree. It doesn't mention it was an apple tree or an orange tree. It was a tree. It did have fruits in it because they could eat from it. He said, don't come near this tree. Then you will wrong yourselves. You will wrong yourselves. Very interesting. When we then analyze the Quran, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a few other prohibitions in the same language, in the same approach. He says, Wala taqraba, don't come near. For example, Allah says in the Quran, Wala taqrabu zina, innahu kana wasa Don't come near adultery, fornication. It is. It is a foul act. Allah calls it fahisha, as in a foul, dirty act. Wasa'a sabila, its pathway will only lead to harm and bad. You want to take that pathway? It'll lead you to a bad end. It has no pathway of a good end. No good pathway. You have to come back. It's like when you're on the freeway and you lose your, t your, your exit, you keep going. You keep going. What, where are you going? You're going to end up further and further away. It's a lost end. You've got to turn back and take the correct exit. So the, similarly, don't come even near zina. Now let's analyze it for a minute. Zina, adultery, fornication. It can be done while a person is married or when a person is single. The punishment for when you are married is worse than the punishment when you are single. But they are both major sins. They are both terrible punishments, both capital punishments in this world, in the, in, according to the Sharia law, and also in the hereafter. If they're penalized in this world, then it's gone for the hereafter. If they repent in this world, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives them. But if they don't repent from it, and they die on that sin, then Allahu Akbar, the punishments are horrendous. This is a warning from Allah in order to guard our chastity, guard our morals, guard our family, guard our society, our community. Islam is a holistic approach. It does not talk about the self, selfishness. Yet a Muslim fits within this system which is selflessness for the others, giving, looking after the society, the community, the young and the old, everybody. We, on the other hand, live in a society, a secular society in which it's the individual. Everything's about the individual. Myself. You can see the effect of it. Selfishness is beyond measure. Beyond measure. We went to a, uh, a Harmony uh, Day activity from our school. And I was one of the teachers accompanying our students. 
just tell you, give you a little bit of an example, something which I wanted to share with you. Our students were the Muslim students, and they were young, year, year eight students, and the other students were of non-Muslim background. So they wanted to do an activity. They gave each person a color, uh, an ob a few objects with a, a certain color. So they separated them into groups. There were the Muslims and there were non-Muslims groups. And they gave each group a particular color and certain objects. What they had to do was, everybody was challenged to create a colorful structure. Any structure has to be very colorful. But each group has one color, green, blue, red. How are they going to do it? They left it up to them. So they thought amongst each other. And the students started to obviously become creative. They went to the other students and said, can I borrow or have one of your colors? And I'll give you one of my colors and so on. So in the end, there was a structure, a colorful one. The non-Muslim students had a very colorful structure big one. Our students did not have a structure. You would think to yourself, is it that they are more advanced than us? They know how to work together? Maybe it seems like that on the surface. But the, 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 the presenter pointed out something which I didn't even realize. He said, the reason why this group has a structure that's colorful is because the other group are the givers and these ones are the takers. You know, Give me. And he could hear some people saying, what do I get in return? Whereas our students, alhamdulillah, they gave and were too embarrassed to ask for something in return. Now that I presume, inshallah, this is the upbringing of the Islamic discipline. This is what Islam teaches us. And so you could see from here, alhamdulillah, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, inshallah. So now, Iblis is trying to whisper so we'll come back. Don't come close to adultery or fornication. Some people assume don't come near adultery means you can go out, you can fondle, you can spend some time, you can do all that stuff, but just don't do the act of intercourse. This is what they think. They think that Allah said, don't do that. If you analyze the verse, Allah did not say, do not commit zina. He said, don't come close to zina. There's a difference between doing and coming close to it. So sometimes when they have something dangerous, they put fences, and the fences are well away from the danger area. And then they put signs. And then if it's still dangerous, they block off the streets, and there's no streets near it. There is fields. So anything that's danger, the more dangerous it is, the further away you are from it. So they say, don't come near the fence. Don't come near and electro electrocute, the f that make the fence electrocuted. Not because the fence is dangerous, what's behind it is dangerous. And the closer you get, the more danger it is. So don't come close to it. Allah is telling us, don't come close to zina. A look is coming close. A touch is coming close. Uh, a sweet word in the haram, in seclusion, is coming close. A number, a, a kiss, a all of these things are coming close. Allah says, well, Allah says, well zina. Zina. Because once you come close to it, you're on, a, on that pathway. And that pathway, if you keep going on it, your temptations and your desires are going to continue to hassle you, going to continue to uh, you know, provoke you, they're going to continue to urge you. And soon you're going to find out why from the story of Adam alayhi salam. Why does a Muslim, why does a human being find it hard to stop? Why do you keep going? Why is it that it doesn't work for us when we say, it's okay, I'll only go this far. I'm not going to go very far. I'm not going to go too deep. And then suddenly you find yourself deeper than what you thought in the problem. Why? Why does this happen to the human? It is the nature of the psychology of the human being which Allah has created and He knows it best. And for this reason He said, لا تقربوا, Don't come close. Similarly, He says to Adam alayhi salam and his wife Hawa, our mother and our father, وَلَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ Don't come even close to this shajara فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ To this tree you will be among the wrongdoers to yourselves. There's something about coming close to it and doing something harming yourself. In a Western society or books that I have read before it seems that they've got a misunderstanding about this concept. You know, Jews, Christians and Muslims talk about Adam alayhi salam and Hawa in a similar way in Jannah. There's a concept that they misunderstand it. As though Allah, God, 
has hidden something away from Adam and is afraid to show it because it's going to cause harm to God. There is no harm to God. Allah clearly expresses, فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ You will be among the wrongdoers to yourselves. It doesn't say to yourself, but the ayat are in that context. And the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ show us. And what happens afterwards you will see. You will be among the oppressors. They cannot oppress Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They cannot do wrong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iblis had oppressed himself. He did nothing to Allah. So now, they're there. And Allah had given the power to Iblis to be able to whisper in a certain way. And we don't understand how he whispers. But a whisper does occur to the human being. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna shaytana la yajrib ibn adam majra dam The devil can travel within the body of the human being just like the blood can flow through the veins and arteries. How is that so? The knowledge is to Allah. Our Messenger Sallallahu told us so. The point of that is that there are whispers that come from the shaitan. And there are whispers that come from your desires. If you want to know the difference, you'd be sitting there and then suddenly there's no obstacle. There's, no, uh, there's nothing that would provoke your desire or, or, or pl place an urge. There are no... So what happens is suddenly you get a bad thought. Go and do this. This is definitely a whisper from the shaitan. And then there are other times, like people I find, some people they complain. They say, brother, in Ramadan the shaitans are meant to be, uh, you know, locked up. But I still get urges in Ramadan. Sometimes they're more than other days. So yeah, of course, it's, it's normal. Because what's left in you are your desires. Why do you think Allah is telling you to fast? Because when you fast, the energy is less in your body. And when the energy is less in your body, your desires are weaker. But for some people, you just got this extra energy surge that sometimes your liver may excrete this energy in, 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 a, uh, in a very um, you know, unexpected situation you have a high desire in certain but obviously in Ramadan your desires are much less than the normal days overall so that there are desires within us Allah tells us in the Quran وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا and the nafs what is the nafs? it's these urges that are inside of us inside of this body of ours which contain conscience and which contain urges and desires of good and bad Allah gave it the tendency to do good and the tendency to do evil he who purifies this nafs takes it zakka meaning to lift it away from indecency lift it away from filth lift it guard it guard it away from what it calls him to do the nafs tells you, try that wine. Everybody talks about it. As a Muslim, I wonder why it's, it's forbidden. Try it. Try to see what's special about it. I mean, there's a secret in there. Try zina. Everybody talks about how good it is. Why don't you go give it a try? Try this drug. Everybody says that he has some feelings. I don't know what it is. The desire tells you, give it a go. Just do it. <laughs> Nike, just do it. Right? That term. You've got to be careful how far you use these terms. Go ahead. So long, now people say today in, in the Western world, so long as you don't harm anyone. Ya ikhwan, there is harm in harming yourself. Once you harm yourself, you're going to harm other people. Allah knows best what He has created. Why we see that a human being goes deep into something and then originally they thought, I didn't want to go that deep, but suddenly they find themselves deeper than what they thought. Hands up those of you who this has never happened to them before. That you've never gone into something that, you know, you think to yourself, I know it's wrong, but I'm not going to go too deep. And then suddenly you find yourself deeper than what you thought. I'll give you an example, maybe for the Shabab, the young people over here. You know, I want to meet that girl. She's urged my desire. I think I love her. Really, it's no real love, it's just a desire. I won't go too deep, I'll just get her number, and we'll just chit-chat over the internet, you know, in my free time when I'm bored. We'll just chit-chat and fill my time. Right? You think to yourself, it's just chit-chatting, man, what am I going to do? I'm not going to do anything worse than that. Or, you know, they talk about music, how beautiful it is. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to listen to a bit of R&B, a bit of, uh, you know, 
a bit of uh, techno, something like that, and I'll just, I won't go too deep, you know, all those people who go really deep, I'm not like them, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to monitor myself, I think I can tr control myself. My brothers and sisters in Islam, anything Islam has forbidden, he knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it will do something to your desire, in which it will take you deeper than what you thought. So then you find yourself going further and further away. Because, I'll tell you why. What happened to Adam alayhi salam? Allah said to, him, to them, don't eat from the tree, or don't come close to the tree. You'll wrong yourselves. Let's understand how they wrong themselves. Iblis knew, remember in our last classes, when Adam alayhi salam was still a statue, Allah hadn't put the soul in him. Iblis traveled through the body of Adam alayhi salam. This hadith is sahih. Through his body. And he found that he was hollow, and he discovered the weaknesses in the human being. Yet Allah had still honored us for some reason, which made him feel jealous. So now he knew that the human being has desires which they can overcome him or her. All he had to do was what? Trigger them. All he had to do was make you think of them. That's all. And so Iblis made Adam السلام, and Hawa to think of the tree. Think of the tree. Think of the tree. Adam and Hawa didn't take that, you know. Obviously, uh, Allahu alam how long it took, but some narrations tell us that it was a very long time, yani decades of years, hundreds of years, before he was able to succeed in making Adam and Hawa eat from the tree. We have two, can, two warnings here, two things to pay attention to within the nafs. Number one, the nafs forgets. So you always need to remind it. You need things to remind it of Allah. It forgets. What do I mean by forget? Not the memory here, the brain. I'm talking about the nafs. It forgets the disobedience of Allah and how bad it is. Depending on who you hang around with. Depending on what you busy yourself with. And in time, naturally it does forget. When you have those whispers, you need others to remind you. That's why Allah says, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَىٰ وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعِدْوَانِ وَمَعْصِيَةِ الرَّسُولِ Assist one another. Assist one another on good deeds and fearing God consciousness. And do not assist one another on sin and injustice and the disobedience of the Messenger So we remind one another. And part of our brotherhood is that we remind each other on how to stay close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to not fall into hellfire because we care for one another. As I said, Islam is a holistic approach. So we began. Now that didn't work. So Iblis went to a further step. He said, think about it. God did not forbid you from that tree except that it's going to turn you into angels. Then he told them, that didn't work. God did not forbid you from the tree except that you will live eternally or something like that. He started making up all these different possibilities. Now Allah had already warned us. He says, الشيطانو, uh, Allah subhanahu wa said to the shaytan, وَعِدْهُمْ وَمَا يَعِدْهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا Now Iblis is taking the first step, which the debate, the first idea, which is when Allah subhanahu wa said to him, give them promises. And beware, human beings, the shaitan will not promise you except false promises. False promises. You can never trust him. And so he used that. It's just, you know, it's the oldest trick in the book for the shaitan. And he continues to use it with the humans till today. Just on a side note, I read about this uh, past scholar. I think it was a tabi'i, 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 it existed probably in the third generation after the Prophet ﷺ. He says, I went to sleep and I dreamt and I saw Iblis. He came to me and said, I'm Iblis. And I said to him, how is your strength against the human beings lately? And he said, Iblis said to me, you know, before I used to give them ideas. Now they're giving us ideas. The human is giving the shaitan ideas. And truly we have gone way beyond Allahu Akbar, the sins which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden, we've gone way beyond that. Don't, don't let me even start on how far human beings have gone with their imagination, colorful of, uh, imagination in sins. So after he enticed them finally in the end, 
It does state in the hadith that Hawa was the first one to fall to the trick of Iblis. Now this does not mean that every woman is weak because of Hawa. It doesn't mean every woman is like that. Yes, it is an inheritance. They are our fathers and mothers. We do inherit things from each other, from parents. But not every woman is like that. So the Christian idea that the woman is suffering with pregnancy and menstruation is because of her eating from the tree is false and, in, and unjust. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى No person who commits a sin, no person, sorry, will carry the sin of another person who committed it. Each person on their own. You do a sin, I didn't do it, you have the penalty, I don't. And vice versa. Adam alayhi salam, a little bit longer, a little short while afterwards, he was enticed to do so as well. And so they finally both ate. You could realize Allah did not remind them when Hawa only approached the tree, but it was when both of them did so. This is from the mercy of Allah. Maybe the husband will be the final person who will stop this and turn things around. But Allah waited. When the leader of the family, when the leader of the family makes a mistake, then everyone under him will also falter. It's the lesson over here. Allah has placed the husband as the qawwam. In the Quran, Allah says, Allah has made the men the protectors and maintainers of the women because of some of the favors and strengths which he has given each one more than the other. Women have strengths that men don't have, men have strengths that women don't have, and men are responsible for donating and providing. The strength that the man has is that of leadership in the family and the provision. That man, when he falters, the wife follows in generally, Akhwan, generally. There are women, of course, who are stronger than the men. But in general case, when she marries that man and, he, and she acknowledges his leadership, then automatically and naturally we rely on that leader. Every system must have a leader. And it would be unfair to place the woman as the leader. Why? She goes through pregnancy. She goes through menstrual cycle. In these situations, she is not entirely in her right mind. There are biological, natural biological hormones that are basically playing up in her body which affect her decision making, her emotions. To place her a leader of responsibility in these circumstances is, un is unfair. But the man can't complain and say, I oh, look in a, I was going through labor. I was going through menopause. I, I had my cycle. <laughs> I couldn't think straight. A man can't say that. So, although he is not perfect, but he is placed in a leadership role. Adam alayhi salam approached the tree and finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now comes into the picture. As soon as they approached that tree, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? In the uh, understanding of the people of the book, Christians and maybe Jews, but especially in the Christian tradition, it seems like, biblically, that God was angry. Lightning, thunder, that type of anger. Such an anger, some of them interpret it to be some kind of uh, over defensive, a defensive anger. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not afraid of anything. Number two, it does not state in the Qur'an or the hadiths any implication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was angry with Adam alayhi salam and Hawa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did become displeased with what they had done for their own sake. You know when a father or mother advises their son or daughter because they have more experience in life, you see. But we, the children, there are stages in our lives where we become very arrogant. We think that we feel sorry for ourselves and we think the whole world's against us and no one understands our pain. 
But why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place the father and the mother in that position of guidance if he didn't know that they had previous encounters like yourselves? The smart person, as my teacher once said when I was back in Lebanon, I remember a teacher, he gave a very good advice. He said, there are some people who learn from the mistakes of others. And there are smarter people, sorry, there are some people who learn from their own mistakes and there are smarter people who learn from the mistakes of others. So take that advice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then when they make a mistake, your children, you're upset. And even if you're angry, the anger is not that of a defensive nature. You are angry for them. You are upset because you want the best for them. Your love made you upset with them because you wanted to see something better for them. There is no parent in the world who would want to see any harm or wrong path to their children. Unless they, are, they have really erred and they've, for example, they, they've misunderstood Allah's guidance, then yeah, they can probably misguide their children. But that's a di different story. I'm talking about when everything's correct, they're advising you something which also befits with Islam and their experience. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Adam alayhi salam and Hawa, what did he say to them? He said to them, Alam anhakuma antilkum as shajara. Did I not forbid you from that tree? He's reminding them. So you can see now, a parent would sit down, obviously, to Allah belongs the best of examples. I just want to get it sort of close to our minds a little bit here in relation by using uh, the context of the parents. A parent who understands how to, tr how to raise their children and how to learn from their mistakes sits down and makes sure, first of all, that they understood the concept. They understood the rule. They understood what's going on. Once they make sure that they understand, then they tell them, how to resolve the situation. So Allah asked them, Alam, did I not forbid you? Do you remember? They said yes. What happened at that moment when they ate from the tree or they approached the tree? There was actually a concealing. There, 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 was, um, there was a part of their body, which was their aura. It was concealed with light, with nur. Obviously, yes, there was you know, intimate activities, but in general cases, they weren't naked, running around. When they took from the tree, that nur went away. And so they were naked. And when we say that word naked, obviously some people, or majority of us, you know, we think, oh my God, you know, this word, nudity or naked, it does trigger something inside of us. It triggers our senses. That's because it is our instinctive nature that Allah has created that we are shy. We are shy. Even a child, seven years old, six, five, four years old, well, even three years old, there comes a stage where they're shy. My daughter is now nearly, nearly three years old. When she wets her nappy, she's shy. And I think to myself, how can she be shy? I never taught her to be shy about that, but she's shy. My son, He's two, three years old. He's shy. He goes to the toilet, something. He's shy. Probably my son is a little bit more shy than others. He won't even change in front of anyone. But it is an instinctive nature in a human being to be shy. You can get rid of that shame by committing the haram. And then Allah says, like zina, for example, when you come close to it, it involves nudity. Allah says, وَسَاءَ sabila." The end road of it is really bad. Your shame goes away. Everything. Now, Look at the combination here. Adam alayhi salam and Hawa ate or took from this tree. Suddenly, the shame came to them. From what? From less covering, less concealment. What is the combination between? Now obviously this was a disobedience. It was a sin. It was a minor sin, but it was a sin. That minor sin. What is the combination between the minor sin of, of approaching the tree and then revealing the aura? This is something extraordinary. What is the relationship between committing that sin and the aura being revealed and so they were shameful? This is because every sin, my dear brothers and sisters, leads to immorality. It leads us to desensitization. You know what desensitization is? Like we're sensitive towards important things. Every sin makes you become desensitized. You no longer care. 
about sins anymore. And even some people, they go very far to the point where it becomes very normal. Adultery is normal. Kissing a girl is normal. Uh, you know, uh, sweet words in seclusion is normal. Forget about that. It's normal now, in some, and I hate to say it, but now it's even among the Muslims themselves. Homosexuality is normal. Homosexuality is normal to some people. Normal. Desensitized. And I repeat, there was, subhanAllah, one time, went to this park, took my children there, and I saw this little girl, I've said it to you before, about six, seven years old, she's trying to play on the monkey bars. Her mother, and she was wearing a short skirt, the little girl, and the mother said, why don't you toss over, twist over, upside down. The little girl said to her mother, she said to her mother, I'm wearing a skirt, mum, meaning I'm shy, I, my underwear will show. That's what she's saying. Her mother said to her, don't worry, you're still a little girl, you can do it. So the girl now, what happened? The mother's teaching made the girl think it's okay. This is the first, this is the beginning, the first step to shame, to, to lack of shame, desensitization. Now, Adai Salam ate from the tree and, and, or approached the tree in Hawa, and so the aura was shown. There is a combination between sin and immorality, sin and indecency, sin and lack of shame. Why did Adam and Hawa eat from the tree? Didn't they know? Yes, they knew. Knowledge, but there was something else. The nafs. It is curiosity. I told you before, why do human beings say to themselves, I'm not going to go too deep. But then they find themselves going deeper. Because inside of our bodies, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah has created a test. Something that we can grow out of and become better human beings, or we can obey and become worse human beings. It is curiosity and desire. So when he told them, don't eat from the tree, there had to be a secret to that tree. Akid fi hasir. There has to be a secret to it. I mentioned this last week. So now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he forbids something, the curiosity of the human being and his desires say to him, why can't I? Why? Why can't I go and do this? Why has God forbidden that? I don't understand that concept. And so you find, for example, a Muslim sister refuses to wear the hijab, because she doesn't understand the concept. Why should I wear it? I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me. Tayyib, don't you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who recommended it for you? Isn't, shouldn't that be enough? If you know Allah, if you really know Allah, you will trust Allah. A man says, why should I pray? I'm a good person. Prayer is meant to make me become a better person. I'm already a good person. Tayyib again. Although you probably lack a lot of knowledge, deep ignorance in, 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 in the uh, benefits of prayer, at least, who is the one who commanded you with it? Allah. Do you know Allah? Do you trust Allah? Tayyip. Obey Him. And watch what happens afterwards. Prophet Muhammad Wasallam prayed even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had forgiven him all his sins, past, present and future. Yet he stayed in the nights until his feet cracked open and pus would excrete from them. Praying. Afala akunu abdan shakura. Shall I not be a thankful servant to Allah in the least? It's a secret. Why? And I'll finish it off with this. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us so that we can grow and become better mu'mineen by forbidding certain things from us. You know the story of Musa alayhi salam and the cow? Tayyib, what happened to the children of Israel at that time? They were with Musa alayhi salam and the man was murdered. So then they said, Ya Musa, can you ask Allah who to find out, so we can find out who killed this man? He asked him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, in order to find the murderer, you need to slaughter a cow. Ajib. You want to find the murderer? Slaughter a cow? In today's world, forensic scientists will think you're a loony. So what do you mean? Imagine that. You go into a, to a murder scene. And you're a forensic scientist. Or you're one of those um, um, CSIs. As you watch on television, CSI. And you go, mm, I know the solution. I think we should go to the farm and get a cow and slaughter it. We'll find out who killed this guy. Now obviously you think to yourself, what's this? Allah says to them, slaughter a cow. Just like in Jannah, he said to Adam, don't eat from that tree. There was nothing special about it. It's just any tree. Uh, it's like saying this, don't eat from uh, yeah, that tree. Just randomly. <laughs> it wasn't about the tree. It wasn't about anything to do with it. There was nothing special about it. But there was something else. I want to teach you how can you grow, how can you come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
It is through the obedience and trust. So Allah said to them, slaughter a cow. What do you think they said? Ya Musa, tatakhiduna huzwa? Are you, are you mocking us? You think we're, we're, we're stupid? You think we're idiots? Atatakhiduna huzwa? Qala a'udhu billahi anakuna min al-jahileen. He said, I seek refuge in God from being among the ignorant people. I, I, I won't trick you in Allah's command. So when they saw that he was adamant, they said, oh, this doesn't make sense. Tayyib, go. Ask him what color it is. Ask him how it looks like. Ask him. Every time he'd go back, he'd come back with a new question. They just can't fathom it, so they kept on asking questions to avoid it. It wasn't enough that Allah commanded them. So Allah now exposed why they are being penalized for what they are being penalized with. And if they ended up in hellfire, why? Because you question everything Allah tells you. Maybe you're here to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll give you the benefits Allah says. I want you to grow better, become better human beings through suffering. But here, one simple command. Just slaughter any cow and you're going to find the murderer. Any cow. They didn't want to take the easy way out. So they kept asking and asking until finally it came to the stage where the command was, it is a cow that is yellow in color, vibrant in color. It has not a single mark anywhere on its body. It has never been touched, never plowed in the land. It has never been mated with any other cow. It is huge, beautiful. And guess what? It belonged to an orphan. And that orphan did not sell them this cow until his mother said to him, tell them to weigh the cow and whatever its weight is, they're going to pay me gold equivalent to its weight and when they slaughter it they got to fill extra to that its piece of skin with gold and give it to us Allahu Akbar they slaughtered it Allah says they slaughtered it and they weren't even going to do that then Allah said to him go to the body of the deceased and hit him with a bit of its meat now this time this is also doesn't make sense to them but they thought look we've copped it we better just listen this time trust in Allah they hit him with a bit of the meat what happened? He woke up. Allah is able to do anything. It's not about the meat. It's not the cow that made him wake up. It is a test of your obedience to Allah. Will you come closer to me? Will you trust me or will you not? I'm just going to give you a little test for yourself. The man said, so and so killed me. It was his nephew because of some inheritance. And then he died again. Ya ikhwan, brothers and sisters in Islam. We ask, why this? Why that? There has to be a secret to it. What is the secret? Remember. Everything that Allah has forbidden us, remember the example of Adam Islam, and Hawa. There was nothing special about the tree, as you found out in the end. Only was about, will you obey Allah and trust in Him? And surely if you do so, Allah will make you a better human being and reward you in this life and in the hereafter. You can reap its benefits. Don't, be, don't let your desires be your God. Let God, Allah who created your desires, be your God. Obey Him and your life will be stable. Disobey him, and the life will become unstable. I finish with this ayah, can I? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillahi ar-rahman ar-rahim. Wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum, wa yuridu al-ladhina yattabi'oon ash-shahawati an tamilu يريد الله أن يخفف عنكم وخلق الإنسان ضعيفا. which means and Allah wants to lessen the burden off you. but those who are deep in their desires want to lead you astray and make life hard on you. Allah wants to forgive you. And those who are deep in their desires want to turn you away from that. But man was created with weaknesses. Meaning monitor those weaknesses, brothers and sisters, and challenge them, wrestle with them, and you will succeed, inshaAllah. Allah does not look at the quantity of your actions. He looks at its quality. هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم